Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. L uh, welcome to this session on the IU data policy frameworks. It will be about discussion the data ecosystem, data landscape in Africa, but we will focus mainly on the recently adopted AU data policy framework. So we have uh, two panelists that will ask with us. We have two ladies. We have Mrs. Areta from Smart Africa and Mrs. Alison Gilward from uh, Executive Director from Research ICT Africa. And we have a number of panelists that will join us online. So I kindly invite uh, Alison and Areta to join us, please. Yes, yeah. Okay, so I think we need to start on time because it is only one hour and uh, I hope the online, con uh, online speakers that are connected. Okay, so as I mentioned, we have a session. It is about the AU data policy framework, but it is more about discussing the status, the readiness of Africa as a continent when it comes to data usage, data governance, data ownership and also how data will support the development of digital uh, economy in Africa and help us to move towards this modern digital society. So with, uh, the panelists, as I mentioned, we have six panelists with us. We have two on, uh, that are with uh, us here and we have uh, four additional panelists that are joining us online. So uh, in the alphabetic order and uh, with all protocol observed, I have me with us Mr. Uh, Sorry, Dr. Towela Nyerin Dajiri, who is the head of economic integration at the African Union Agency, Development Agency, Audanipat. We have Mrs. Areta that who is with us. She is project manager in charge of data governance at Smart Africa. We have online Mrs. Stella Ali Batisi, who is director of the National Data Protection Authority of Uganda. We have Dr. Alison Gilward, who is the Executive Director of Research ICT. We have Mr. Torbjorn Frederiksson, who is uh, Economic Affairs Officer, E-Commerce and Digital Economy Branch, Division of, on Technology and Logistic of Onyctad. Last but not least, we have Mr. Uh, Gishard Sangu, who is the Director of Postal, Telecommunication and Digital Economy with, within uh, Central uh, Economic uh, Region. It is ECAS. So as I mentioned, the discussion is about the AU data policy framework. This document was, the strategic framework was developed by the African Union Commission with support and in collaboration with all regional organizations as we had a task force and we, we went through uh, discussions and also collaborative work. We also had online open uh, consultation that were op uh, open to all stakeholders before we moved with our draft, taking it to our member states for the first review and validation before formal examination by the specialized technical committee and the adoption of the uh, document strategic framework by the AU summit in February 22. So now the document is available online. The, docu uh, the strategic framework aims to, to set our priorities, our vision, our principles with regard to data. We aim to, to harness the potential, the transformative potential of data to empower our countries, our citizens, to safeguard the, ri the rights of the individuals and also the rights of our countries in global digital economy. And we aim to achieve equitable and uh, uh, equal opportunities to all African citizens in digital space. So the objective is to support or to provide guidance to African countries in developing their national data systems and also to, to create a comprehensive, co coherent and also harmonized data systems across the continent that will ena enable us to efficiently use data and enable data to flow across the countries in support of digital trade and also data-driven businesses. So the policy framework, as I mentioned, is now in the fa second phase. It is the implementation phase. We come up with an implementation plan that was uh, discussed with our countries and now it is validated. And also we propose the capacity assessment tool that will help countries to self-assess their data landscape and 
for us as uh, regional uh, continental organizations, will, it will help us to identify the individual needs of countries and also the collective needs in, and to build on that to come up with uh, dedicated programs and initiatives. So we will not be long. We have with us six distinguished panelists that will help us to discuss how to accelerate the implementation of this framework and also how to to, to find like the adequate governance uh, systems that will fit the Africa context and also respond to African needs. So with this, we can start with our first question. It is addressed to Mrs. Stella, and we start with from the national perspective. I would like to hear from uh, 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 Mrs. Stella Albatisi as director of Data Protection Authority of Uganda, what this, the adoption of this framework represents for them, for, the, for them, and also what are the, the challenges in implementation and domestication of this framework, which is quite comprehensive, since it addresses data from different perspectives, from personal, non-personal data, and th there is many uh, aspects that has been addressed in this framework. Stella, over to you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be here and thank you for this uh, invitation. Um, I'm very happy to be talking about uh, domesticating the AU data uh, policy framework because I believe it's a good way forward in terms of us harmonizing within uh, the region, how we deal with data and how we secure that data. Uh, what this means to us as Uganda or even other countries uh, in terms of domestication uh, would need to make sure that we um, provide for these recommendations within our various policies. In many cases, we may uh, need uh, to review existing policies or even to prepare a standalone uh, policy. Uh, for Uganda, I know we've already started on the national data strategy. And um, recently, we had a workshop about maybe a month ago where we were considering who are the stakeholders to involve, what are the key issues. And I had the benefit of also presenting um, the AU data policy framework and what the lessons are for Uganda. So within that national data policy, it will be very critical for us as a country uh, to provide for the recommendations that are provided within uh, the policy framework. The beauty of the AU data policy framework is that the recommendations are very clear. Uh, the framework provides actions. Uh, AU has done an implementation plan and is also providing for M and E, which I believe will really support uh, the different countries in domesticating uh, this framework. Beyond the policy development, of course, once you're done with the policy development, uh, within Uganda, when we develop policies at national level, they are required to be approved by the cabinet. The cabinet is the highest decision-making body uh, for government. Once cabinet approves that policy, then it makes it much easier for the implementing ministry to cascade it to the other ministries, knowing that this policy framework requires a lot of collaboration across uh, different sectors. Um, we'd also expect that once the policy is approved, then we'd also review our standards. What kind of standards do we have that supports uh, the framework. If they need amendment, this would be the time to do those amendments. And of course, ensuring that we involve as many stakeholders as possible. Uh, lastly, uh, because we are given a very limited time, uh, there are certain aspects of the framework that, be, that require implementation beyond policy development. Uh, things like the data infrastructure, things like the uh, resource mobilization, all these require uh, funding. And for us in Uganda, for you to get funding for those initiatives, you must make sure that these recommendations are embedded within the national development plan. If you have anything that, is, that you want to implement, 
and it's not in the National Development Plan, then most likely you will not be able to get the resources. So in a nutshell, um, for us to really implement this uh, framework, we need to update our policies or develop a new policy. We need um, to develop our standards that will enable this interoperability. And then uh, we need to make sure that those um, items or recommendations that require uh, funding are provided for within our national development plan. Thank you, Sohila. Thank you very much, Stella, for uh, respecting the time and also for highlighting that you already started like introducing the data policy framework at national level and also highlighting the actions that need to be taken at national level in order to domesticate the framework. And we take as a, uh, as a recommendation is the need to align the actions and recommendations of uh, continental frameworks to the national uh, development plan and the, to facilitate their implementation at national level. I will have the opportunity to hear from you and uh, during the question uh, and response uh, session. So with this, I move to the second question, which is uh, our uh, second panelist, who is Mr. Gishard Sango. We would like to hear from the regional perspective, from regional organizations, what needs to be done, what are the priorities, and also what the capacities that are needed to enable the regional economic communities to support their member states, and also, if need be, to develop like regional data markets. Uh, Mr. Tsango, you have the floor. I don't know if Mr. Tsango is connected. Or maybe we can come back to Mr. Tsango later. Oui, allô? Oui, oui, bonjour. Just to, oui, bonjour. Yeah, just to let you know that Mr. Tsango will speak in French, but I will summarize his intervention for those of you who don't understand French. Thank you. Oui, bonjour. Donc, vous pouvez... Bonjour. Bonjour, bienvenue à ce panel et merci d'avoir accepté notre invitation. Je ne sais pas si vous avez merci. entendu la question. J'ai entendu la, la question sans problème. Ok. Donc, je voudrais d'abord remercier hein, la Commission de l'Union africaine et le GIZ pour avoir invité la Commission de la CAC à, à prendre part à cet important panel qui porte sur l'implémentation du cadre politique des données de l'Union africaine. Je ne sais pas si je dois terminer mon intervention ou euh, la traduction va se faire au fur et à mesure. Quelle est l'approche que tu proposes euh, I pro Je propose que vous finissez votre euh, intervention, après je vais résumer. Je pense que ce serait plus pratique. Merci. D'accord. Donc, pour revenir sur la question posée, les priorités au niveau de la CEAC dans l'accompagnement des États membres, parce que comme vous le savez, la CEAC est un des piliers de l'Union africaine. Donc, euh, toute politique, tout cadre juridique adopté au niveau de l'Union africaine, nous en approprions pour que nous puissions assurer les implémentations au niveau des États membres. Euh, pour insister sur le fait que, je voudrais insister sur le fait que nous, comme nous le savons tous, hein, les données sont de plus en plus considérées comme une ressource stratégique. Hein. Hein, du fait qu'elle offre de nouvelles opportunités dans l'entrepreneuriat pour les entreprises et les particuliers. Donc, euh, les États membres de la CEAC n'échappent pas à cette révolution hein, que, que les données sont en train d'apporter dans l'écosystème numérique. Donc, la CEAC a apporté une réponse globale hein, dans sa stratégie de transformation numérique Hein, qui se repose sur plusieurs piliers. Je, je vais essayer d'aborder ra rapidement. Donc, le premier pilier sur lequel nous nous avons travaillé, c'est euh, améliorer l'accès aux infrastructures. Parce que pour, avant d'arriver à manipuler les données, il faudrait que nous puissions disposer des infrastructures qui permettent, hein, que ce soit le stockage, le traitement ou euh, voilà, le stockage, le traitement de ces données-là. Donc, Face à cela, les chefs d'État et de gouvernement de la communauté ont 
adopté en juillet 2020 un plan d'action consensuel de déploiement des infrastructures de communication électronique pour l'Afrique centrale. Donc, ce plan d'action regorge ou contient l'ensemble des projets d'infrastructures dont nous avons besoin pour bénéficier de ce qu'on appelle de l'économie numérique. Et parmi ces, ces projets, nous avons les interconnexions entre les capitales des États membres, l'ensemble des 11 pays membres, nous avons euh, les points d'échange Internet régionaux que nous devons mettre en place, hein, car nous, comme nous le savons tous, ces points d'échange régionaux, si nous voulons bénéficier de l'impact que les contenus, que ces, ces données-là puissent offrir à l'ensemble de la population de la sous-région, nous devons disposer des points d'échange régionaux pour faciliter l'accès à ces différentes données. Et nous, dans ce, dans ce plan d'action, nous avons aussi des infrastructures de ce qu'on appelle les data centers, des, des infrastructures de stockage de données. Hein, ici, il s'agit de faire de sorte que chaque État membre puisse disposer d'au moins d'une infrastructure nationale de stockage de données et qu'au niveau de la sous-région, nous puissions disposer des infrastructures sous-régionales de stockage de données. Et euh, on ne peut parler de la, comme on ne peut parler de la manipulation des données sans pouvoir parler de la notion de sécurité de ces données-là. Donc là, nous parlons maintenant de la, cyber, de la cybercriminalité. Et ici, nous voulons doter aussi de nous, l'ensemble des États membres, des infrastructures qui permettront aux États d'être dotés des équipements pour répondre rapidement en cas d'attaque cybernétique. Et le deuxième pilier sur lequel nous nous, nous, nous sommes basés, c'est le pilier qui consiste à mettre un environnement favorable, hein, un environnement favorable pour sécuriser les données, pour donner la confiance à l'utilisateur et aussi pour favoriser euh, l'innovation. Et euh, pour ce faire, au niveau de la CAC, nous avons, euh, les chefs d'État toujours ont adopté des, des lois types des lois type sur le cyberespace. Et donc, il s'agit de la loi type sur les transactions électroniques, la loi type sur la protection des données à caractère personnel et la, la loi type sur la lutte contre la cybercriminalité. Et euh, la commission de la CEAC s'est attelée à accompagner les États membres dans l'incorporation de ces lois type dans leur législation nationale. Donc, Aujourd'hui, cet environnement est très indispensable, n'est-ce pas, pour, pour pouvoir assurer, comme cela nous a été recommandé dans ce cadre qui nous réunit aujourd'hui, hein, de, de mettre en place cet environnement favorable pour la gestion de ces données-là. Et outre cela, c'est bien beau de disposer de ces textes-là, c'est bien beau de, dis, de disposer de ces lois types, mais il faudrait que les rôles et les responsabilités de chaque acteur qui intervient dans l'écosystème puissent être bien définis. Et c'est en cela que la CEAC s'est proposée de pouvoir élaborer au niveau sous-régional une stratégie régionale sur la cybersécurité et la lutte contre la cybercriminalité. Ce sont des actions que la CEAC s'est proposée de faire de développer aussi une stratégie régionale sur le commerce électronique. Donc, c'est en cela que je fais un clin d'œil aux, aux, aux partenaires, qui sont, que ce soit techniques ou financiers, qui peuvent nous accompagner dans ces défis-là que nous nous sommes proposés en réponse. Hein, en réponse, n'est-ce pas, à, à l'implémentation du cadre de politique des données de l'Union africaine. Le temps qui nous est donné est très court. Je ne sais pas si ce oui, là, je suis dans le délai où je peux continuer. Je vous, je... Je vous remercie infiniment, M. Tsango, pour ces commentaires oui. et aussi pour, ce, pour cet aperçu sur la situation de l'Afrique centrale, de la CEAC, quant aux oui, différents textes qui ont été adoptés dans le cadre de, de la numérisation et aussi dans les données. On aura l'occasion de revenir vers vous dans la session des questions. Donc, uh, maybe I just try to say the intervention of Mr. Tsango from East Africa community. 
He highlighted that uh, regional economic communities that are the build on building blocks of the African Union, and we need to work in close collaboration with them to to implement this AU data policy frameworks, taking into account that data is a strategic uh, resources. He highlighted a number of uh, frameworks that have been developed by the region, and uh, some of them they are being implemented. Namely, the, he talked about the digital transformation strategy for Central Africa region, master plan for development of uh, infrastructure, broadband infrastructure, and to, uh, inter uh, to interconnect the different countries of this uh, region, and also the need to have a regional and operationalized regional uh, internet exchange point, a region, uh, need to have a regional data center, and also he mentioned a number of model laws, like model law on da personal data protection, on e uh, cyber criminality, and also the, he, the, the perspective of developing a regional uh, strategy for the on cyber security for East Africa, uh, for Central Africa region. I think we, we do understand that the, the, reg the regions within the continent, they are, have their specificities. So when we talk about Central Africa, East Africa, and Southern Africa region, there is different, some differences. They are all within the context of, the, of uh, Africa and the African Union, but we need to take into account the context and the need of each uh, region. He mentioned that in, in to enable these regional economic communities to support or to, to implement this uh, strategic framework, we need to build capacity and also the need to realign all the regional frameworks to the continental frameworks because the data policy framework was recently adopted. So the next step for the regional economic communities is to align their model laws and uh, their policies to this uh, framework. I think we heard from the regional perspective. We have a speaker we, from the Audanipad as the implementing agency of the African Union. I don't know if uh, Mrs. Uh, Tawila is connected or not. Otherwise, we can have her once she is ready. We have also with us from the regional perspective, we have a representative of Smart Africa, which is quite present in uh, the digital development landscape in Africa. We have Mr. Mrs. Arita Mare, who is the project manager on data governance. Maybe the question that we would ask is how Smart Africa can support like in identifying the, the barriers, like uh, the barriers from the legal, from the regulatory perspectives that can help us like that we need to, to, Im to address in order to enable data to flow across the continent in support of the development of our digital economy and society. Uh, Stella, please, you have the floor. Okay, good morning, everyone, and thank you uh, for, to the AU and JZ for inviting Smart Africa to this panel. Um, I'll just start by sharing a brief background of what Smart Africa is for those who are hearing about it for the first time. So Smart Africa is a Pan-African organization uh, with about uh, 35 member states at uh, present. Um, and we have several projects uh, all focusing on digital uh, transformation. So I'll share, uh, beginning of tw 2020, we uh, conducted a study on data protection and privacy frameworks, looking at uh, harmonization challenges and also how uh, we can enable cross-border data flows. Uh, we also did a survey to our member states uh, around various topics to do with data governance. So what we found out, uh, one of the uh, key uh, factors that affect uh, cross-border data flows is a lack of trust. But from our study, we found out that uh, looking at the data protection and privacy laws, uh, at the time of the study, it was th there were about 32, uh, that there are a lot of commonalities and similarities between the frameworks than there are uh, divergences. So I think starting from where we are in terms of uh, assessing what the adequacy uh, provisions are. Um, and then the second thing that I want to mention is a, a lack of infrastructure. So uh, from basic in infrastructure itself, digital infrastructure, and also um, data infrastructure. So uh, when we look at data centers, uh, Africa uh, has about 1% of multi-tenant uh, data centers. And we have uh, a project on data centers that's uh, working towards establishing TFO data centers on the continent. 
Um, and then uh, looking also um, at interoperability of systems, we have a project called uh, the Smart Africa Trust Alliance, which is working towards um, uh, enabling the transfer or sharing of data between countries without necessarily having the data move uh, from um, the countries themselves. Um, and then the second area, uh, the third area that I want to talk about is the lack of adequate uh, technical capacity, uh, looking at skills itself. Um, I think as Africa, we have to work towards uh, creating an army of data professionals so that we are able to uh, innovate using data. Um, and then moving also to um, the data protection authorities, uh, we see that most of them are not well resourced. So in terms of uh, technical capacity itself and also uh, in terms of funding. So uh, if we have data protection authorities that are well resourced, then we also have better enforcement capacities. And then uh, Stella mentioned uh, the issue of developing uh, data policies uh, in line with the recommendations that are in the data policy framework. So it's one area. Um, I'm glad that Uganda is on its way. I know also Sierra Leone and uh, we are working with Senegal and Ghana to develop their national data strategies. And I also know S South Africa was working on one. I'm not sure if it has been approved yet. Um, so I'll stop here um, and we'll take further questions. Uh, thank you very much, Stella. I think we, we will have the opportunity to take questions from the floor. And uh, thank you for highlighting the work that is being done by Smart Africa Alliance in building the human and institutional capacity of African countries in order, in order to enable them to put in place the necessary uh, means and tools to respond to the digital uh, challenges. And it's good to mention that some countries, they have already started developing their national data uh, strategies and uh, they are uh, in, uh, inspired by the AU data policy framework. And I think we, for, uh, for us, we, n we take it as very good progress. Now we move to Dr. Allison. I think we mentioned that one of the main objectives of developing this uh, strategic framework is to achieve a high level of harmonization of our data governance systems to enable data to flow within countries and also between countries and to support the development of intra-Africa digital market, to support the development and integration of Africa, uh, the agenda of the continent. So from your perspectives, how can we achieve this, uh, this harmonization, taking into account the, the complexity of Africa with countries with different uh, levels of digital uh, transformation and also data readiness? Thank you very much, Suhila. Thank you. Um, so I think the most important thing with the issue of harmonization is that this is you know, a, a not only a political imperative in terms of Agenda 63 and various commitments to um, harmonizing our you know, universal human rights frameworks, our people's um, rights frameworks on the continent, um, various kind of uh, developmental commitments on the continent, but it's absolutely um, essential to creating this enabling and trusted environment in order for us to um, harness the benefits of the uh, data economy and of digitalization and datafication that's happening across the content, uh, across the globe very rapidly, and without which um, we are again going to be left behind, and we are um, not only going to be left behind, we're going to be increasingly harmed by not having a, a risk mitigation strategy for these very, very um, powerful forces, which have positive implications, but also you know, potentially harmful ones. So um, I think you know, the harmonization is absolutely critical um, in terms of a data environment. If we're going to get the kind of economies of scope and scale that you need for a, d a data economy and uh, to you know, uh, get sufficient participation in that economy, to get sufficient investment in that economy, and for, to do so, we need to create this enabling um, and trusted environment. And it's, it's really this that will en enable all the countries of the continent to, and people of the continent to participate more equitably in this you know, fabulous opportunity but potentially risked environment um, that, that is occurring around us. And that really requires um, you know, a, a, a principled commitment which the African Union framework does. It's a high-level principled commitment to the realization of this 
you know, single digital market, this integrated um, uh, trade environment that we're going to see, that we're seeing in process with the African continental free trade area, um, but also creating a um, rights preserving uh, environment for uh, users on the, uh, of data on the continent, but also to create the environment for data producers. Um, too long Africa has been the recipients, the data subjects, the excluded from these uh, markets. And it's really the commitment to, this, to harmonization that will um, allow us to create this um, enabling and trusted environment. However, the document is also, it's a high level document, it's uh, aligned with other initiatives across the continent. It's also a very pragmatic document. And I just want to say for people who aren't aware or familiar with it, you know, it's much broader than a data protection document. This is a full data, um, you know, data policy framework for Africa. So there's a lot of um, uh, uh, commitments to creating, as I said, this um, economic market on the, on the continent, the single economic market um, that could have um, more, more equitable benefits. Although there's been some work on data protection across the continent, of course, we have our Malabar Convention, which unfortunately many years on is still not ratified. This document acknowledges that the, you know, the uneven development that we have across the continent. And in that way, it's quite pragmatic in adopting a progressive realization of these high level principles, acknowledging that we will all need different environments as our um, colleagues have been saying um, before, before us. And I think that's a really critical um, aspect of this because it allows us while committing ourselves to these important harmonization principles to in the meantime, adopt certain things that we can do without you know, all having to commit to that very, those very high level principles that we are simply institutionally, economically, whatever, unable to right now, there are, there's a lot of low hanging fruit that can allow us already to create interoperable markets, integrated um, data systems. Um, so one of the things is that we do commit ourselves to developing regional standards, standards that would be adopted at the national level that would allow for integrated national data systems, which in many countries we don't have. We've got the private sector doing its own thing and others doing their own thing. So it would allow us to get these nationally um, integrated data um, systems that would also be able to be interoperable at, at, the, at the continental level. Um, so there's many of these steps that we can do. It's absolutely critical for um, achieving the um, objectives of not only um, you know, deploying data as a strategic asset for private data value creation, which has been the emphasis or is the dominant um, model of um, value creation globally, but to unlock, which I mean, you know, enormous potential in Africa, public value in the system and ensuring in our government systems that we leave space and enable and, and you know, um, uh, nurture uh, public value spaces, data spaces, data commons, these kinds of things in the environment, but also making available um, public data, um, uh, you know, for use by governments, but also by, by entrepreneurs and startups and those sort of things that could really get this data going. And of course, you know, getting the half critical part of the harmonization is to get these um, essential data flows that we need across the continent in order to, um, you know, generate this, kickstart this um, data e economy on the continent. And, you know, for us all to benefit from this, um, data has no value in and of itself. If we just hold that data and it's not processed and it's not, um, you know, used productively, it has no value for you. So as Africans, we need to ensure that we are um, you know, integrating where we're doing this. If we don't have a data center, we probably can't all afford data centers. We need to identify how these can be um, aggregated. Where's the best place to aggregate these? Who's got the power? Who's got the risk? And then they become available to all of us through data sharing mechanisms and those types of things. So perhaps just to say, I think the harmonization, of course, is our high level principle, but there are so many steps that we can do right now. And the very exciting part and pragmatic part of this um, framework is that it is now in its second phase. It's got an implementation phase. That's been a critique of our policy up to now is that we, you know, great policy never gets implemented. Well, here it is in the implementation phase. Our colleagues have spoken about the challenges of implementing at the local level, but having a framework to do this in which we can peer, in which we can collaborate, um, in which we can coordinate our efforts will mean that we'll be able to move so much more quickly um, to, to that. I thank you for highlighting that uh, harmonization is an objective and it needs uh, collective efforts to achieve it and this uh, data policy frameworks 
lay the foundation with the high level principles and key actions that we need to take both at national level and continental level in order to develop this consolidated uh, data ecosystem in Africa that will enable uh, data driven economy to, to develop in our conti continent. But uh, what we want to say that this uh, data policy framework takes also into account the international discussions and also what is happening now in the world, like there is discussion about the development of the need to have a, a global approach and also there is di uh, discussion within the World uh, Trade Organizations on how to manage uh, cross-border uh, data flows. And with this, we have our uh, last panelist, who is Mr. Torbjorn Frederiksson. He, he may give us an overview on what the work is uh, of UNCTAD on the cross-border data flows and the relation with uh, the economic development. And also, maybe he can maybe advise how Africa can be part of this global discussion. And for us as a regional and continental organization, how we can prepare our countries to be part of this debate. Uh, Mr. Frederiksson, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Suhila, and good morning to everyone. Greetings uh, from uh, Geneva, where I'm heading UNCTAD's e-commerce and digital economy work. Uh, let me start by congratulating the, the uh, AUC for the development of the data policy framework, which can uh, serve as uh, a basis from which to, to strengthen uh, data policies throughout Africa. Uh, if well handled, data can really help to address many of the world's and Africa's major development challenges, such as green transitions, food insecurity, pandemic preparedness, as well as more transparent, accountable, efficient, responsive, and effective governance. Data can transform research and development. They can lower the cost, reduce waste, enhance trust in economic transactions, and improve the quality of decision-making at all levels. But development gains from data, as has been stressed, cannot be taken for granted. If not well handled, and if not refined, the growing reliance on data may well result in greater divides and greater inequalities. And this is what we actually have seen during the pandemic, where the shift to digital has really supported uh, those that are best uh, equipped and best prepared to harness data. And even levels of readiness in this area to engage in and benefit from the data-driven digital economy. Um, we can see that in terms of the data infrastructure, in terms of digital entrepreneurship and skills, as well as in the availability of financial resources and institutional capacities for digital transformation. The shortage of appropriate skill sets in governance can also result in insufficient representation of technical and analytical expertise in legislative as well as regulatory framework development processes. And this in turn can hamper the ability of governments to identify the opportunities that could be afforded by digital technologies as well as the potential risks and threats that could emerge. And that means they will be hampered in terms of regulating both the opportunities and uh, threats. Now, data policies in Africa are of course affected by those implemented elsewhere as well. So at the same time, the global landscape of data governance that we are seeing now, as of today, is highly fragmented. And this risks risks leading to rising tensions among the main realms of data governance, like China, uh, the US, and uh, uh, the EU. Uh, and it can also lead to increased fragmentation of the internet. We have seen as, uh, the, the increased use of data localization requirements as an attempt to try to protect data inside the country, um, uh, while uh, that may have uh, Justifications, it may also risk reducing the opportunities that data and data flows can, can generate. So it's against that background that UNCTAD and others have been calling for the development of a balanced global approach to data governance that could help secure inclusive development gains. And ultimately, we think that the goal should be to enable data to flow as freely as necessary and possible, but while being able to address the various development objectives of countries. A number of policy areas are relevant to consider in this context. It involves, for instance, agreeing on definitions and taxonomies for establishing terms of access for different types of data, 
strengthening the measurement of data, data flows and their value, dealing with data as a public good, exploring new forms of data governance, agreeing on rights and principles as well as standards. And moreover, given the prominent and growing role of the major digital platforms, which are particularly well placed to harness data, there is a need to discuss international cooperation on the governance of these platforms in the same context. For example, with regard to transparency, competition policies and taxation. Similarly, international cooperation on data for development is also critical important and not sufficiently developed yet. In order to ensure an inclusive process with representatives of all the development countries, including Africa, we think that the United Nations should play a more prominent role than it currently does. But even within the UN system, there is currently a lack of holistic treatment of data. We have discussions in the UN that are also in silos. We have therefore pointed to the need for a new United Nations coordinating body or mechanism for data governance with a clear mandate to work on data with the right skill set, set up. It's not going to be easy to find this necessary framework that we require it will require innovative and bold thinking about the form of global governance. And, but it will also need member states, not least from Africa, to be fully involved and on board from the outset. And let me conclude by just noticing that determining the best way forward here will be very difficult, but it's still necessary. How we deal with data will, to a large extent, determine if digitalization will bring inclusive and sustainable outcomes or lead to a further widening of the digital divides and income equality, inequalities. And African countries need to weigh in in this process on how to shape the future in this area. Thank you so much. Thank you, we thank you for your uh, participation in this panel because we do understand that we cannot work in uh, silos and, uh, and also highlighting that the global data governance landscape is uh, is currently uh, fragmented and there is a need to move toward more balanced approach and inclusive approach and we have seen that the report of UNCTAD of 21 he made a recommendation on UN to play a central role in this uh, move and also the need to create a dedicated body from within the UN to to deal with data and for us we as maybe as a country, as a, from the Africa perspective, we would advocate for more uh, capacity and also sharing information with developing countries to enable them to be part of this uh, process. I think with this we come to the to the end of the interventions of the panelists, and we open the floor for questions. We have uh, 15 minutes, so feel free to raise your questions. I would kindly pro uh, invite you to be concise and also to introduce yourself and to whom the question is addressed. I s we start with this side and after that we we'll move to this side. Hi, hi, thank you very much. I'm Kevin Zanderman from the Tony Blair Institute. Uh, I ha my first question is for Stella. When you were mentioning like the work that Africa's been doing on cross-border data flows, you mentioned a particular form of data governance where the algorithm travels and it's not the data that travels. I imagine that you're referring to federated, federated learning models techniques. So I wanted to ask you like, if you could sort of expand on the state of the implementation of this technology and also data trustees in Africa. That would be really great. And my second question is, I've seen that the data policy framework doesn't mention extraterritorial jurisdiction and data, such as the Cloud Act or the National Intelligence Law. And I was wondering whether, you know, this was, was this part of the conversation and whether also the African Union is sort of thinking about, for example, following the EU model with Ga Gaia X and sort of trying to build a, an alternative cloud that let's say it's sovereign or whether that was, wasn't part of the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I propose we take three or, or four questions. Three questions. We respond to them, and after that we move to this side. I don't know from this side. Yes. Uh, 
Hello, thank you very much for the very interesting panel discussion. My name is Martin Hallen from the Datasphere Initiative and Internet Jurisdiction Policy Network. And we just on Monday released a cross-board digital policy uh, report uh, about the state in Africa. Uh, the question that I'm having is also what the um, vision is for next year concerning the more experimental interplay of the implementation mechanisms that will be necessary to be agile to dock onto what uh, Tioburn was referring to, and also a uh, contribution that we would like to give. We will announce a cross-border uh, sandboxes for data forum for Africa that will start next year, where we'll try to bring experts from around the globe, including the global south also, onto the continent to experiment with responsible data sharing frameworks. And also here, uh, yeah, a big proposition to uh, experiment together and investigate the questions that also the colleague from the Tony Blair Institute was raising. Thank you. Is there a question from this side or maybe we move to the other side? Yeah. So, another question. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Sabina Dewan. I'm the executive director of a think tank called Just Jobs Network. Uh, thank you for a very stimulating discussion. Um, I think this panel talked a lot about uh, how to overcome fragmented data systems to create more uh, interoperability and harmonization across data governance. But I'm wondering if you could also shed some light on how we obtain data from tech companies, from platforms, for example, if there's any efforts underway to broker data sharing agreements to obtain this data if we're coming from a spirit of using data as a public good for, for all of the things that Mr. Frederick Fredrickson had laid out. Um, I was wondering if the panel could shed any more light on that. Thank you. Thank you. I think maybe we can take all the question, uh, fourth question and we respond because I, I think we yeah, you can have the floor, please. I'm Charles Kajoreka from Malawi. I work for Youth and Society. Yeah, so in Malawi, we, we are at the stage where we, we are developing the data protection um, uh, law, and we're also developing the data, the National Data Center. And we also just wanted to learn from you what the experience of civil society in terms of participation in those processes, and also the citizens in such processes. And I would also want to I uh, collaborate, or I would speak to different actors here that would be willing to support civil society participation in such process, but the data protection uh, legislation and also monitoring um, the process in terms of the establishment of the data center that we are working on in Malawi. Thank you so much. Thank you. I think maybe we, we respond to these questions and we'll take second round to the questions. So, I would kindly invite the panelists to respond in two minutes. One of the to take one of the questions. I think the one, the first one was uh, addressed to Stella. I was. <laughs> I was. Uh, uh, yeah. I think I can share my screen. So Stella, are you online? Uh, yes, I'm online, but the question was for Aretha because uh, it was related to uh, the system they are developing that enables data sharing without the data moving. Okay, so this is uh, still a pilot project. It's called the Smart Africa Trust Alliance. And um, mm -hmm. the, um, the first focus is uh, around uh, uh, digital identity use cases. And um, I know they're working with Benin uh, in the implementation. I, I don't have further details on it, but I'll be happy to um, share contacts with you and share more information later. 
Uh, Alison, I don't know if you can take w some of the questions, maybe in two minutes, try to address some of the questions that has been asked, namely the data sharing, the need to have data sharing agreements, and also the, sub the cooperation with data sphere initiatives on the standbox. And I think the last one for was from Malawi, about how we can support uh, Malawi in development of data protection laws and also about citizen participation in the law, in the drafting. I I, po I put all the questions to to Alison, but you feel free to respond uh, to one of them, and we'll hand over to the other uh, speakers as well. Sure, I'll do that. Um, so the the um, issue that was raised around. Um, GX and intelligence and those sorts of things. I think um, that just to emphasize that the framework was a very high level principle document. So some of those implementation questions were, um, are not addressed specifically there. They're, being, they're coming up now in some of the implementation aspects of this. But currently there was no um, discussion within the task force around um, the GIX systems or you know, whether we should be doing that. Likewise, the um, uh, uh, task force, uh, the, the, the framework's commitment is very much towards the kind of policy experimentation that would be s suitable for our context and that would come up with new things, not just a, a you know, stick and paste policy from elsewhere. So I'm sure the regulatory sandbox will you know, have um, space to do that. Again, it's not been in the implementation um, discussion sort of yet. Just very importantly on the data sharing uh, aspects and um, extracting data <laughs> from the big platforms. So uh, as I said, the document, the, the framework you will see draws on the uh, digital transformation strategy's commitment to open data on the continent and to the provision of public data. So I think this is a very nice continental commitment which can unlock some of that public value. That's a different question from getting um, arguably public data, um, but data from um, big platforms um, and getting them. So this is obviously the bigger discussion around uh, global collaboration and cooperation and how you know a small country like Malawi or even a you know, whatever bigger country in, in Africa or bigger economy in Africa um, on their own are probably not going to be able to do very much. And so the document speaks very strongly to um, sort of louder African voices um, in, uh, and, and harmonized positions, you know, caucus positions, so that we're actually engaging in these international fora. Um, um, Suhil has already mentioned a number that, of course, we've had a very fragmented approach to in many ways. Um, but just to say, you know, a lot of people feel that it's not possible. And I think if we look to other examples, you know, 10 years ago, we never thought we would be able to get uh, digital tax taxes, you know, from country, um, operators that aren't operating in the country. And through a global, you know, regime reform, um, that's possible now. So the possibilities of making those a requirement of these public, you know, big platforms, and I'm speaking on my own behalf now very much, but you know, making that a, a, a requirement to big platforms that are using public resources, namely the internet, et cetera. You know, I think collectively and collaboratively that kind of um, quid pro quo ex exchange could, can happen. Okay, thank you very much, Alison. I think the qu uh, there is a question on the participation of citizens in the development of uh, national data protection laws. I think we invite Stella to respond to, to this question. We, ta we see what, how Uganda is handling the development mm -hmm. of uh, legislations and how they engage with different st stakeholders. Stella, if you can address uh, it in two minutes, please. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Suhila, for that question and uh, the gentleman from Malawi. Um, I believe Malawi, uh, their legislation uh, process is similar to Uganda. In our case, um, as you develop a bill, you're required to publish this bill and uh, get comments. And it's a requirement even before it is approved. Uh, even when it goes to parliament, which is the last stage, uh, parliament also invites uh, stakeholders uh, key stakeholders to participate and even the, the public. So my, um, my proposal to the gentleman, first of all, is to engage the Minister of Justice or uh, the Solicitor General, whoever is in charge of developing that, uh, that law, and of course the Ministry uh, in charge. Uh, or even the regulators, because I know, I think it's the Malawi uh, Communications Commission uh, is also heavily involved uh, in this uh, process. 
once you engage them, then you, you'll be able to know when this publishing is supposed to be done. I find that the involvement of civil society is very important, especially in as far as it enables government to also realize how critical these laws are. And it also enables um, uh, wider discussions about issues to do with uh, privacy and data protection. I believe it can be done. Uh, it's just a matter of uh, being aware uh, and uh, when the publishing is supposed to be done and then uh, submitting comments. I find that when you submit written comments, you're more likely to get uh, feedback than when you wait you know, to speak in a workshop. Thank you, Suhila. Stella, I think the last question that we, we have is about the exterior. Sorry, uh, you want to come up? On, okay, so we can continue. Yeah, just to come up quickly um, to the question that came from uh, the gentleman from Malawi. On a pan-African level, uh, at Smart Africa, we have a framework of engagement. So we have uh, projects on data centers. We also have um, a project that we did on data protection that I mentioned. So please, uh, mm -hmm. you can reach out and then we can see how you can also be part of this. And. Um, in terms of the question that came from Martin, uh, at Smart Africa, we are conducting agile regulation training through the Smart Africa Digital Academy. And we are also looking forward to also um, start implementing uh, around uh, data sandboxes. So hopefully we'll be able to, um, to engage in that area. And then we are also working on a data governance blueprint, which is based off uh, recommendations from the Continental Data Policy Framework. And if there is anyone who is interested in participating, you can also reach out. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Stella. I think this brings us to the last question, that it is about the extraterritorial data localization. I think uh, we'll ask Mr. Torbjan to help us on this. What are your perspectives? Because like the AU data policy framework highlight like uh, our uh, our recommendation on data localization, but we don't see it as uh, as a constraint for the da development, but it is rather part of the data landscape. And I wonder if the uh, global and balanced data governance system will recommend an uh, ex uh, extra, extra territorial data localization and I think it is the main uh, discussion around the global data governance and uh, the fragmented frameworks right now. Thank you, Sohila. Let me try to uh, address some of these. I think they're all connected in a sense, these questions. So. But I think first, uh, when it comes to the question of platforms, uh, I think this is where, where it comes uh, to the question of right to access different types of data. There's one thing to control public data that uh, the government has full control of, but when data is collected on the citizens of the country and they end up in the private universe, then uh, there is a question of how do we regulate what access the, uh, that the people uh, and the, the countries have to access these kind of data. There's a question of transparency here as well. I mean, in the financial sector, we have very strict rules on how much information that the financial players need to provide to make sure that the financial market is, is uh, working well. The platforms are not uh, in the digital space, are currently not under a lot of pressure to share data on what they're doing, on algorithms, etc., because this is perceived as a, per as a private um, uh, asset. Uh, and uh, this is something that needs to be discussed. And I think this has to be raised at the global level because the, the biggest platforms, they are really, uh, uh, they have a global reach. So it's very difficult for individual countries to negotiate this with uh, each platform. So there's a need for a global uh, discussion. And finally, on the question of um, civil society's role, it's extremely important that the civil society is, is involved, not just in reviewing specific pieces of legislation, but really in the broader discussion about how to leverage data uh, for development. Data are so multidimensional. They are, have economic implications, but also non-economic uh, implications for human rights, privacy, etc. And the civil society has an important role in this context. And so therefore, going forward in these discussions in countries and globally and regionally, we need to have processes that are both multi-stakeholder and multidimensional when we talk about the implications of data for development. Thank you again. 
Thank you. Thank you for uh, emphasizing once again the the need for global discussion on different aspects because like data is multidimensional and also it has the its nature is cross border so country but cannot manage it by itself but there is many things that need to be discussed and need to be agreed at uh, global level and uh, i think now we, uh, we see that countries they are all in the phase of developing their, their data capabilities and also their data systems. And they hope with this, uh, the UN will facilitate this discussion as you highlighted earlier, that you pr uh, as one of the recommendations is to have UN playing uh, a role to bring all countries together. I think we can take second round of questions if there is any questions. Yes, I have one there. Please, who has the mic? Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, an Ethiopian and a government delegate from the Information Networks uh, Security Administration. And uh, <coughs> I'm personally, I'm a data science researcher. And the problem we have in here in Ethiopia uh, is far from the framework that we are talking in here. Uh, what I mean by that is like uh, the people in here knows land, water resources very much than the data resources, okay? Data is far from us. Uh, the community in here like takes uh, the internet as the social media, like social media is equivalent like the internet, okay? We are talking in here something different. Uh, my fellow uh, Malawian there asked uh, a genuine question, okay? How we are going to participate, the people, the society? And uh, there uh, another fellow asked, like, how to make uh, public property, okay? La um, data as public property, okay? Land as public property is our real question, okay, in here. But data as a property is very far from us, okay? So how do we co uh, reconcile, reconcile these things, okay? That's my question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Tesfai Noai from, uh, from Ethiopia. I came from the judiciary. Um, it's a good uh, presentation, and I find the policy is very good for, for the Africa. But I have some uh, uh, fear that if we are not customized it, if we are not harmonized it with our own policies, with our own legislation, then it's going to be a problem. As you pin pinpoint it clearly that uh, we have this Malabo uh, Convention, but it has not been signed, ratified, but at least by half of African countries. Therefore, this sensitization workers and also follow-up is very critical. Having a good policy is good by itself, but if that policy is not going to be implemented, if that policy is not going to be customized by these African countries, then having policy by itself does not create any value. Therefore, is there a mechanism that uh, you have put in this policy for the sake of sanitization and for sake of... Uh, uh, follow up. I think that's very critical. I think a missing link in 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 um, this digital uh, di di digital uh, uh, creating digital societies in Africa. The second one is uh, this policy is good policy, but I think we need to have a, an overarching project that could uh, that that could um, uh, that, that could help African countries to share data to use that as um, uh, like having an infrastructure, soft infra infrastructure, maybe hard infrastructure, that could may, maybe as an indicator, as a signal for African countries to, to share data. Therefore, what, what, are, uh, what are you thinking on that? The last one is, is there a, 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 an element that has been included in the policy uh, to share data between different sectors like between justice sectors in one African country to another African country 
information data, economic data, and other type of data. Uh, I think sectoral level coordination and cooperation is also very important. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if there is, maybe you can take the last one. Yeah, we take the last question from this side and Dr. Tunku. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Jose Fisaka. I coordinate the Chad Youth IGF. Uh, I would like to ask questions about uh, Central Africa uh, framework. Uh, uh, comment est-ce que vous comptez uh, inclure en fait les réalités uh, linguistiques locales pour faire en fait des utilisateurs finaux uh, les, les propres en fait uh, acteurs de les acteurs en fait uh, de leur propre sécurité en ligne et comment est-ce que vous comptez créer aussi des contenus qui prennent en compte les réalités uh, linguistiques uh, sous-régionales Merci. Merci. Donc, I think with this we conclude. I have been told that uh, the last question is in French, we need to translate it to English. It's about uh, how to include the local languages in the reality of uh, in digital uh, content and to reflect the realities of the Central Africa region. I, we have uh, four questions. I think myself, I will respond to one respond, uh, to related to how to customize and how to ensure the implementation of this framework, because you mentioned the Malabo Convention, which it took time to, to, be, uh, to enter into force. And I would say that uh, this time we moved quickly, like uh, this, uh, this framework was adopted in uh, February this year, and we moved with the development of an implementation plan and also self-capacity assessment tool that will be put at the disposal of countries that they can self-evaluate their uh, data readiness and identify their needs in terms of capacity. And for, for us, it will help us to identify the individual needs of countries, and from there we'll see what are the collective needs. And from there we will move towards developing the, like uh, continental uh, projects and initiatives that will help uh, to, to support countries. And as it was mentioned by Areta, there are al already some initiatives going on in line with the implementation of this uh, framework. And also I, we ha uh, we, I received a message from Auda Nepad, Mrs. Towela. She was not able to, to participate, but she, she, uh, she reiterated the commitment of Audanipa to work with the countries to support them in the implementation of this framework because Audanipa is the implementation agency and they are already working in close collaboration with the countries. And also uh, to conclude on this, I would say that we are working with our partnership uh, to include data and digital in the agenda of our overall partnerships with our partners. And we have GIZ who supported us for the organization of this uh, session. And we are mobilizing our resources in order really to implement this uh, framework. And the difference between the Malabo Convention and this framework, this Malabo Convention is a legal framework, is an instrument that needs to be ratified and there is procedures within each country. That's why it took a uh, long time. But this one, uh, this one is a strategic framework, it's policy framework. So countries will go to implement and uh, like it, it is high level uh, recommendations, but it will not like prevent countries from um, uh, implementing their national priorities and also to align to their national uh, needs and also, but uh, the difference is that we have a policy framework, it's a high level recommendations, it is kind of roadmap. But the Malabo Convention is a legal instrument and also we are close to getting these 15 ratifications and the inter uh, force on the Malabo Convention, which sets the principles for the pr personal data protection. And many countries, they are already aligning themselves to this uh, Malabo Convention. I think I responded to one question. I think maybe I will give the floor to, uh, to one of the speakers. It's about the how to engage citizens to let them know what is happening about data, the use of data. I think maybe, Alison, you can address this. Thank you. I did just want to, in, in the context of the framework, because I think the questions that were answered here, and, you know, in the case you were giving in Malawi, are really um, you know, our, our central challenges um, on the continent. So we, you know, the problem is, is that we have over half the continent 
um, you know, not connected to the internet, not actually, although they're affected by this data environment every day and are at risk every day, because even though those people aren't connected, for example, through bio-ID systems, through all sorts of, you know, um, algorithmic decision-making that's being made with their national data, they are now being exposed to data, even though, and, you know, directly, even though they're not able to control it or whatever it is. So th I think the importance of this document is that I think it looks very different from any other data policy framework in any other region. It's, it's an African contextualized document. And before we talk, talk about the data economy or the data environment, we speak about Africa and we speak about digital readiness and we speak about data infrastructure and getting people online and skills and awareness and those sorts of things. We know from research ICT's Africa's own after access surveys that, you know, even if people become connected, they don't have the necessary digital skills, but more importantly, the educational skills to actually not only just use the um, instruments as, you know, effectively for transactions, but to actually produce with this data. So we've got a human, you know, enormous human development um, challenge and policy and practice that needs to go across all these um, you know, uh, uh, economy and society where data is affecting everything. And I think there is, this is acknowledged in the document. There are also some critical principles in the enabling framework around data justice, for example, that I don't think you're finding in other documents at the moment, that's saying, you know, a, a, a safe and secure environment, so cyber secure and a data protected environment, doesn't give you a trusted environment, that you actually need legitimacy of your institutions. People need to be able to trust them in order to use them. And I think there's that kind of, you know, really trying to understand you know, the challenges that face us in Africa that, that are well captured in the document. In relation to the question of, you know, the, just, the justice data and you know, across border um, sharing of information and that sort of thing, the document recognizes that this is a very complex area, this is a high level principle, but that there will have to be data re regimes in order to ins ensure that there's research data shared that there's justice data shared. And of course, because this was developed in the context of COVID, very importantly, that health information um, is shared. So um, I urge you to look at the document. Obviously, the challenge is now in the implementation, in the detail, in the developing these. But I think a lot of these areas are identified in the policy framework as areas that need to be taken forward in strategy. Thank you. I think we, we invite Mr. Gishar to respond to the last question about the local languages. Monsieur Gishar, vous êtes là? Oui, je suis là. Okay. Okay. Merci beaucoup pour la parole, Souila. Donc, pour répondre à la question qui a été posée sur des questions, sur des, le contenu local en matière de langue, et que le rôle que nous avons en tant que ce soit État ou euh, communauté économique régionale, c'est de pouvoir mettre en place un environnement favorable qui va encourager le développement de ces contenus. Donc, euh, nous mettons à disposition des, des infrastructures qu'il faut, les cadres réglementaires qu'il faut pour favoriser, n'est-ce pas, euh, le développement de ces, de ces contenus. Bien entendu, Euh, au niveau de la CEAC, euh, lorsque nous avons effectué des, des ateliers régionaux sur des points d'échange Internet, nous avons fait de la sensibilisation pour encourager, pour encourager, pour encourager le développement de ces contenus lo locaux. Il nous appartient pas de développer, mais nous devons encourager, n'est-ce pas, ces contenus, le développement de ces contenus. Et l'encouragement, comme je l'ai dit, c'est en mettant en place le cadre réglementaire qu'il faut, les infrastructures qu'il faut à travers les, les infrastructures de stockage de données, en travers les points d'échange Internet régionaux ou nationaux. Je voudrais aussi, avec la permission de Souila, revenir sur une question qui a été posée sur l'implication de la société civile. Donc, aujourd'hui, au niveau de chaque État, il est encouragé que nous puissions organiser hein, des forums nationaux sur la gouvernance de l'Internet. Donc, ce cadre-là peut aussi offrir un cadre de concertation où tous les acteurs qui interviennent dans l'écosystème discutent des projets ou des actions que le gouvernement est en train de mener. Donc, cela offre aussi euh, une approche pour impliquer tous les acteurs qui interviennent dans l'écosystème. Et dans le processus d'adoption de, de nos textes communautaires, 
lorsque nous organisons des réunions des experts, des États membres, pour valider ces cadres juridiques ou ces politiques, nous, nous impliquons toujours la société civile, nous impliquons toujours les universitaires, et ils apportent leurs préoccupations sont prises en compte hein, dans les textes que nous élaborons, et puis euh, les textes poursuivent leur processus normal d'adoption. Voilà ce que je, je pouvais dire. Merci. Je vous remercie, euh, Guichard. Uh, Guichard mentioned that uh, the, the role of regional economic communities is to facilitate, to create the enabling environment, but they don't develop the content. But they support countries and they provide guidance to countries in order to, uh, to include and to work with the civil society to take into account all their uh, comments and also to, to in shaping the local uh, policies and legislations. Uh, I think this brings us to the end of this uh, session. Join me in thanking our uh, panelists for their uh, responses and also for, uh, for sharing all the information they have shared with us. Unfortunately, I cannot give them f floor to conclude as we, we run out of time, but uh, just I want to thank them. Thank you for your participation and we invite you to continue the discussion outside. Thank you very much. Thank you.